So morning everybody and thanks for being interested in a subject slightly away for your main conference uh, issue. So uh, I will discuss, I will introduce you today to the routes towards quantum computing followed using superconducting quantum bit circuits. So rather than speaking of the routes, I should rather speak about the roadblocks that stand on these roads. As you will see, these routes are not easy ones and uh, you still can keep your, your PC in your, in, in your case. The quantum computer is not yet there. So what, what you know attending this cryptography conference is that the experimental demonstration of the violation of Bell inequalities triggered, uh, yes, uh, it really triggered the discovery of protocols for secure quantum uh, communication. And frankly, that entangled states provide a resource for quantum communication, it did not come as a surprise. The, the shock, a bigger shock came when it was understood very soon after this experimental breakthrough that, say, uh, entanglement provide, and quantum mechanics provide a resource for performing quantum computation faster than with classical computers. I don't know, maybe you were not born at that time, but uh, you have to think that um, the fact that the complexity classes of mathematical problems, this is not mathematics, the complexity of a mathematical problem that you want to run on a machine, this complexity, in fact, is physics. It depends on the hardware. And the discovery was that a quantum hardware can be far more efficient, even exponentially more efficient than a classical hardware, at least for performing some specific tasks. So uh, very quickly, uh, the blueprint for a quantum computer was established. So you have bits, but now you have quantum bits, and you need to to provide a set of gates, a universal set of gates, in order to be able to perform the unitary evolution of the whole qubit register. So these qubits can be in superposition of states, and the state of the machine can be in any superposition of all the register states. It's a lot. Now you have a Hilbert space, with a, so it's a lot of space. And you have to perform the readout. Of course, there are criteria for that, and these criteria have been established by David DiVincenzo. It's a, these are common sense criteria. You need good qubits with coherence. You need to be able to reset them. You need to be able to perform a unitary evolution with good accuracy, with excellent accuracy, and you need to be able to perform the read, to read these qubits with a high fidelity. Ideally, with a projective measurement, the, the ones that you learn in the textbooks. So very, very quickly, all physicists thought, why, my system could be the one for that. And say, electrical, say, uh, physicists working with electrical circuits thought the same. The, say, computers are made with electrical circuits, and this is the most convenient thing, the most convenient implementation. To, to be able to address your circuit by electrical wires. So I will discuss a little bit electrical implementations. And while well, the, the electrical circuit that you know, whether it's, uh, say, a, say, an integrated circuit or not, these circuits, usually, they do not behave quantum mechanically. The current inside the transistor in your, in your PC, the current in any of these transistors is a classical variable was with time fluctuation. It's okay? <laughs> there is nevertheless in the, in the lab one, one element, uh, one component which, uh, which behaves really quantum mechanically. This is uh, the Johnson junction between two superconducting electrodes. This is a very simple common component that I will introduce to you in a short while. And this component is basically just uh, two layers of superconductors separated by a thin oxide layer so that the electrons can tunnel from one layer to the other one. And by tunneling, they couple the two superconducting electrodes. 
So with these components, uh, I show here, say, one example of a qubit circuit that we made about 10 years ago. So more, a little more physics, I apologize. It's a, so the junction is characterized by a single degree of freedom. So it's a single degree of freedom with two variables. The number of Cooper pairs that have been transferred between the two sides and the phase difference. So these two variables, theta and n, are conjugated variables, just like position and momentum for a particle. It's simply that the phase is, uh, is um, two pi periodic. And the Hamiltonian of a Josephson junction is extremely simple. It's just the Josephson Hamiltonian minus ej cosine theta, where theta is the phase difference between both sides, plus the electromagnetic environment of the circuit around. So it's as simple as that. And the simplest circuit you can think of is to, uh, to place such a junction, which is the square with a cross inside, the symbol for junction. You can connect it to a voltage source through a capacitance. This way, you define a small island uh, between the capacitance and the junction with a given number of Cooper pairs inside. And the Hamiltonian, which is written here, is extremely simple. This is, in some sense, the equivalent of a hydrogen atom but for an electrical circuit. This is very simple Hamiltonian, which is solvable, exactly solvable. And uh, it was developed uh, we, in uh, about, five, about almost 20 years ago. Uh, but the breakthrough was really uh, uh, performed, uh, you will see uh, in a few seconds, by the NEC team when they demonstrated quantum coherence. So soon after the development, uh, this first development, in fact, uh, um, the quantum behavior of a Josephson junction was demonstrated in the early 1980s. Uh, this was quantum tunneling. So, uh, since uh, 1999, we have a qubit circuit with increasing coherence time. And uh, all these circuits have some scalability potential that we will discuss. There are other implementations in electrical circuits, in particular with quantum dots, but that, that I will not uh, discuss them. So very uh, brief history of the Cooper per box circuit, which was the first circuit used to demonstrate quantum coherence at NEC in 1999. You have a picture of the circuit used. It was a bit indirect. Uh, there was no readout of the quantum state. It was indirect evidence of quantum coherence, but uh, it, uh, it was a surprise. At that time, it was not known that an electrical circuit like that could behave quantum mechanically. Would you believe that a piece of dirty metal on top of a piece of dirty metal and linked by evaporated uh, thin nanowire can behave quantum mechanically? That you can have current flowing in opposite directions at the same time in a circuit? Many, many quantum physicists simply did not believe it would work. It was not obvious. Now that it has been done, it, it's easier. So uh, about very quickly, uh, just a few years ago, we, we at SACLE, we could gain, um, we, say we implemented a strategy for fighting decoherence, and we implementing a, a single shot without method, so we are able to measure the quantum state in one shot without averaging. And we could gain two orders of magnitude on, on quantum coherence for the circuit. A few years ago, later, directly inspired by uh, what was done in the lab of uh, kessler brossel the lab of Serge Arroche, Jean-Michel Raymond, and Michel Brune, uh, the Yale group of Rob Cholkov developed the so-called circuit QED with a Cooper pair box embedded in a microwave circuit. I will explain to you what it means. And they gained about... Uh, factor 50 again by putting the, even the qubit in the, in, say, in a cavity, in a microwave cavity. So the current time has increased from about a few nanoseconds up to about 50, 50 microseconds at best. So you might think that thanks to this progress, uh, quantum processes have been developed. Well, in fact, uh, it's not so easy. So what, uh, what about the, say the, the last version of the Cooper pair box, which is the one used in um, most experimental labs working on the superconducting circuit? 
So the last version of the superconducting uh, Cooper of the Cooper pair box is uh, so it's represented here uh, at the top. In fact, uh, in this regime here, the the Johnson energy J is so large that uh, the system is almost in the phase regime. So the phase is almost a good quantum number. So this is the potential here minus Ej cosine delta, and you have quantum levels in this potential, and when you have enough, uh, say, an harmonicity, the two lowest energy states, 0 and 1, form a qubit. In fact, here, uh, the Cooper pair box in this regime is just a nonlinear resonator with enough nonlinearity. So when you put this Cooper pair box in a microwave resonator here, please don't pass in front of the projector, in front of the beam. You here, uh, you have a circuit which is very analogous to cavity QED. It's called circuit quantum electrodynamics. So the, the only thing you have to know is that the, the, say the resonance frequency of this resonator, it's a lambda over 2 resonator, this resonance frequency is slightly affected by the quantum state of the Cooper pair box. In fact, the effective Hamiltonian is simple. If we call sigma z the operator for the quantum state, so sigma z equals plus minus 1 for the two qubit states here, in fact, you see that the frequency of the, say, the frequency of the resonator here is slightly shifted by this quantity plus minus chi. So you have a microwave resonator, say 5 gigahertz, whose frequency is slightly changed by a few megahertz depending on the state of your qubit. This is the so-called uh, qubit control cavity pool, and this is how the readout will be performed. At the same time, uh, the frequency of the qubit is slightly affected by the, by the state of the, of the resonator. So, so now you can wonder, with these wonderful qubits, why uh, don't you have a quantum computer on your table? It's that, uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's, it's a bit difficult. So this is a very short history of the subject. In 2009, the, the, Yale, uh, the Yale team of Rob Sholkov uh, made the first uh, two-qubit processor, but this two-qubit processor was not fitted with readout. They could demonstrate gate operation without being able to run a real algorithm. So the real, operate, the real processors were developed at Santa Barbara by John Martinez, uh, and uh, they were able to perform the Dutch Joda algorithm, and they could found, find that 15 is five, five times three. Now, uh, in, in, our, in the Quantronics group, we, we have worked on the, say, a simple processor also, and we could demonstrate the Grover search algorithm on four items. So you can wonder why such a slow process is because there are very difficult scalability issues, and here I list just a few ones. Say, to maintain quantum coherence when you may fabricate a complex circuit, you need uh, the readout, high fidelity readout is very difficult, and there is a quantum error correction problem which has not, not yet been solved satisfactorily. So let, let's continue. So I will uh, show to you what we have done on a very simple example. So here is a two qubit processor, two qubit uh, with single qubit gate and with um, coupling gate here fitted with individual qubit readout. So the circuit is uh, shown here. So you have the scale, so it's on a, it's on a, it's a, it's a chip. So you have two qubits, two, one and two. These qubits, each one is coupled to a readout circuit, and they are capacitively coupled here. And these qubits are tunable, so the junction here is a double junction. So when you apply a fast flux line, you can modulate the effective Johnson energy. So the, the qubits are tunable, and they are coupled, capacitively coupled, electrostatically coupled. You have here, say, the central region here it shows. We have the, the qubit. Basically, the qubit is a capacitance, intergitated capacitance here that you can see here. And this, there is a Johnson junction on the side here. So it's a... 
So the readout. The readout uh, is not formed by a, a usual linear resonator. It's slightly different from the Yale design. Here, we have a non-linear resonator. And the ID, the only ID thing you have to remind on this readout, that thanks to this non-linear resonator, it's possible to control a transition, which is called a bifurcation transition. You see, with normal linear physics, you can do a lot of things. In this device, thanks to, non, to the non-linearity of this resonator, you can control the state of the resonator by the qubit state. So you have an instability, which slightly depends on the qubit state. Here, so this is a phase diagram for this instability between low and high states. Here you see, depending on the qubit state, here you have, so this is the resonator frequency, and this resonator frequency slightly depends on the qubit state, as I already told you, this is the cavity pool here, which is a few megahertz. So by arranging the power of a signal sent to this resonator and, uh, and the duration of this of a pulse, you can arrange yourself so that, depending on the state of the qubit, it stays the resonator stays in the low state for one qubit state and moves to the high state for the other one. This way, we map the state of the qubit on the state of the resonator, and the state of the resonator is then determined using microwave methods. So by sending then a, a longer microwave pulse, we can decide if the state of the resonator is low or is high. This is a bit equivalent to a quantum-limited discriminator. So let's see now the, the coupling between the two qubits. So we have a capacitive coupling here. And this capacitive coupling uh, is it's not switchable. But since the frequency of the qubit is controllable, in fact, this coupling is only effective when the two qubits have the same frequency. When the qubit frequencies are very different, with a difference much larger than the small coupling G here between the two qubits. In fact, you switch off the, you switch off the interaction. And on resonance, uh, the, the evolution operator induced by this gate is extremely simple. And here is an example of a forgiven value of the, the interaction time that you may recognize. This evolution operator is just the square root of phi swap gate. And this gate is interesting because it's a universal one. Combined with single qubit rotations, this square root of phi swap gate is, provides a universal set of gates for the evolution of the qubit register. You agree? So application. So we, we want to demonstrate a quantum algorithm. This quantum algorithm is the following one. You have, say, four, four caps here. You have one item which is hidden under one of the caps. And you have to find this item. So what you have at your disposal is a discriminating function, f, that is able to tell you, if you lift the cap, this function will tell you, well, this is 0 here and 1 here. So the classical algorithm for finding the solution uh, is extremely simple. It's just a, a query. So you pick at random one cap. You evaluate the discriminating function. And uh, you may win. And the, win, say the chance to win is 25%, one quarter. And there is a quantum algorithm which is interesting because in this case of four items, there is a quantum algorithm with a single core of the discriminating frequency allows to find the solution. Do you believe in that? Well. OK, so here is the, the Grover search algorithm in this case. So we start with our two qubits, and we prepare, as in most quantum algorithms, we apply a rotation of pi over 2 around the y, the axis y in the block sphere, which means that you prepare here the state 0 plus 1. Here, you also prepare the state 0 plus 1 of a square root of 2, which means that the state here of the qubit register is the superposition of all the qubit state registers, all, all the qubit state, 0, 0, plus 0, 1, plus 1, 0, plus 1, 1. This is very common 
in most quantum algorithms, you start by preparing a superposition of all the states, all the basis states. Then, here is the unknown, uh, say, say the, the, he, the, say the object is hidden here in this sign plus minus one plus minus one, because this function marks one of the states. So this is the unknown uh, function given, which is given to you that you have to identify. And here, so you apply it once, and then you apply, you decode, and the decoding step is universal, of course, and then you read out. And here is what you get when you mark, say, uh, when you take the function that marks, say, zero, you find zero, zero here at the readout. These are raw data without any correction of anything. Raw data, you find basically zero, zero, the correct answer with a probability 67%. And we, when you mark one, one, you find it with 52%. So in any case, the success rate of this algorithm is much larger than one quarter, which is the value for a classical query and check algorithm. So this is a demonstration of, uh, of the so-called quantum speed up. But of course, it's a demonstration of quantum speed up on uh, such elementary problem that it, which is, so it's a bit, a bit useless, but this is a proof of principle for the demonstration of quantum speed up of a quantum algorithm in a case which is solved. I would like to remind to you that is, it has not yet been proven that there is no efficient classical algorithm for factorizing uh, large numbers. But, uh, so now let's discuss a bit about readout scalability. And one of the main issues is indeed uh, to, perform read, to perform the readout of a large qubit register. So, there, so here is an, architect, an architecture one could think of with many qubits. So here is a qubit. Here is a linear readout resonator here. That this is a so cavity. It's equivalent to an LC circuit. So this is the standard architecture developed in a few labs. And a way to, uh, so, you, so you have so your qubits here in frequency, your qubits, and here you have the different readout resonators. So of course, uh, you need here, if you want to be able to perform a readout, you need to, to use a so-called quantum-limited parametric amplifier. So this is a device which is developed now in about half a dozen of labs around the world. And it allows to, to measure say, to perform measure measurement by adding the minimal back action authorized by quantum mechanics. So the decurrence that you induce by using such an amplifier just corresponds to the amount of, Im of information that you take from the system. So this is an example. And so the, all these resonators have to find inside the bandwidth of this amplifier, and there are issues that uh, all these amplifiers, they have a limited bandwidth, typically 100 megahertz, and they cannot, uh, they, they have very low saturation power. As soon as you put too much power, they saturate. So there is uh, quite a lot of research to improve the situation. And uh, the architecture I will uh, show to you here is a slightly different one. So we have all our qubits, but again, this, now they will be coupled to nonlinear resonators. Now, the issues are slightly different, that these nonlinear resonators can interact between themselves, so it's not easy. And the signal processing is more complicated than in this case. So here is what we have done uh, recently. So we have just, uh, we just wanted to demonstrate multiplex readout. So we have here four cells. So each cell consists of, a, a, say, a Cooper per box here, this transmond here, and a readout resonator with a Johnson junction embedded in the middle of inductance. So this is this, this now this is a nonlinear resonator. And now all the signals are sent through the, on the same line, and now they are they will be processed by using say a, a regular cryogenic amplifier. So there was a poster recently, and a paper has been submitted. So here is uh, what we do with individual qubit readout. So uh, we will perform the readout, but in order to improve the signal to noise, 
we will also induce a transition from state one to state two before performing the readout. So, um, so when so we apply this pulse to the system, uh, the pulse is reflected and we analyze the phase, the, the different uh, amplitude in the complex plane at the, at the resonator frequency. So for each resonator, we get, say, uh, we get a point at each me measurement, a point in the so-called in-phase and quadrature uh, amplitude. So this is called an IQ plane in the language of microwaves. So what you see is that when you prepare each qubit in a superposition of zero plus one state, you see two clouds, and these two clouds are well separated. This means that there is a good discrimination of the two qubit states. So if you want uh, more details, uh, this is what happens when you apply, say, a microwave pulse for the readout with a varying amplitude here. This is in the ground state, uh, and this is here in the excited state by applying this so-called shelving pulse to state two here. So there is quite a huge separation, and we apply a pulse at this power. You see that basically, if it's in ground state, it will not bifurcate. There will will not go to high state, and if it's in the state one, it will. So there is a good discrimination about uh, about 98 percent. So now uh, demonstration of multiplexed uh, readout. So we apply microwave pulse to all the qubits. We apply Rabi pulse in order to induce rotations. Uh, starting from zero, we go to one, and we rotate between zero and one. Of course, we do not apply all the rotations at the same time, because uh, the qubits uh, say would interact because of stark shift. But that we can slightly separate our qubits uh, rotation. But what we do not separate are the readout pulses. So these are the different readout pulses. And in the end, this is uh, a recording of simultaneous Rabi oscillation for the four qubit or the qubit registers, of the qubit register. So it's, uh, this is not, uh, this device is not yet a full operational processor, but the difficult part of performing the multiplex readout has been, has been solved. Multiplex is that you are able to perform the readout of all the qubits with uh, the same uh, circuitry. So, so because it's, uh, if you have n qubits, uh, you could think of pre installing n readout circuitry, one readout circuitry for each qubit. This is too demanding. This is demanding yes. Yes. So, but multiplex, say in communication, you know that. Multiplex circuitry is rather common. It's the same thing here. It's, uh, so if you can multiplex, it's much better. So this is, as I told you, this is, a, this is n plus one solution because we have one line here that carries all the drive and readout signals. They are sent and they are received here at the other hand. And there is now n, n, n lines for tuning the qubit. So we have and control lines here for tuning the, each qubit, and we have one, for one line for driving, multiplex driving, and multiplex readout. Otherwise, it would be impossible. So in the two qubit processor that I have shown to you before, each qubit had its own readout circuitry. This is not scalable. This is f not easily scalable, but far more than installing a readout circuitry for each qubit. So you cannot pile microwave generators in the lab uh, till, till the ceiling. It would be a bit too expensive. So we have demonstrated here multiplexed uh, qubit readout. So it's, uh, now what the scalability of this strategy, we think that we could make up to about 10 qubits, but uh, we, have not, uh, we have not done it yet. Now, uh, let's switch to a quantum error correction. So for a quantum computer to be useful to something, you need uh, at least hundreds of uh, logical qubits. When what we call logical qubit is a robust qubit uh, corrected from, from errors. So there is, a, as you know, 
uh, if you read uh, Nis and Chang, you will find quantum error correction codes. And the idea is that it, uh, say you cannot clone each qubit. Uh, you have to, to build operators, which are called syndromes, that allow you to detect which error has been performed so that you can correct it after what. It's demanding in terms of resource, but it's even more demanding in terms of uh, accuracy. So you can correct for error, for errors, provided that all, all, all your gates have, um, say, a threshold error, which is smaller than 10 minus 4. So it's very demanding on the hardware before being able to implement any correction. So now the state of the art is that uh, the, the team of Leo Di Carlo at Delft uh, is developing a circuit almost, uh, almost about like this one for correcting a bit flip of a single qubit. So the correction of a bit flip of a single qubit is beyond reach. It's within reach. It's not beyond, which is a progress. Now you may have uh, heard about the, the surface codes so, so the surface goals are less demanding in terms of gate error. They could tolerate about 1% gate error, which is better, but they are extremely demanding in terms of resource overhead. <laughs> Basically, for making one, one logical qubit, you need about, about 1,000 of physical qubits. So this is, a, you can wonder if this is realistic. I let you make your mind. And then, people are thinking of different, different paradigms to get rid of this a bit crazy uh, quantum error correction uh, problem. So the surface code, uh, I will not explain to you what it is, but if you want to know, this is an excellent reference. It's, uh, it comes from the idea of Kitaev, Preskill, and uh, the stabilizers developed by Daniel Gottesman. So it's a 2D array of bits, of qubits, of physical qubits, separated in two, category, two categories, the data qubit for memory and the measurement qubit. So you can, um, by applying uh, sequences of gates and measurement, it's possible to correct for errors. But it's extremely demanding because for building a logical qubit and for performing gates between these logical qubits, you need 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 more physical qubits. It's a bit unrealistic. So there is a preliminary 9 qubit test circuit which is now developed at Santa Barbara by John Martinez. And note that John Martinez now has made a joint team between Santa Barbara and Google. So I'm not sure that Google will really develop the surface code computer, but this may ring. This rings a bell, definitively. So John was the postdoc with us long ago. So there is now a different strategy which is developed at Yale. So the idea is to uh, uh, get rid of the qubit, to use the qubit just for the interaction. And the idea is to use a, a high quality re microwave resonators for storing the qubits. And then use the nonlinear component here and use pumping. So by, by, by combining the suitable nonlinearity and suitable pumping in a, of a readout, of a low-Q readout cavity, it's possible to force the dissipation, to engineer the dissipation felt by this memory. So this, this cavity, instead of losing photons one by one, will be forced to lose photons two by two or even four by four. So we see by, by engineering the dissipation, in fact, you can increase the coherence, which is very um, non-intuitive. So it's, a, again, there is a, a good reference paper here in New Journal of Physics. And the mathematician in charge of that is Miyazar Mihaimi, who works at INRIA and with, uh, and, uh, with partly uh, at INRIA and partly at Yale. And in this cavity, they, so they, what they propose is to fabricate, uh, to prepare cut states built with current states of the resonant cavity. So it's a bit complicated, but these cut states are more robust against decoherence. And on top of that, it's possible uh, to detect the, the errors that are, say, the, the small errors that are made, and it's possible to correct for the errors. But 
at the expense of uh, extremely huge complexity. So as you see, there is, for uh, presently, there is no satisfactory uh, scalable architecture, but there are attempts in various directions and preliminary experiments. And uh, last but not least, uh, you may have heard about hybrid systems. So as you know, there are many, say, nature provides to you many good quantum systems. If you take, say, a nuclear spin, say, the nuclear spin, a nuclear spin can have a current time of minutes, even hours. So as compared to electrical circuits, which have current, much shorter current time. So the idea is that it could be possible to take the best of natural quantum system and of electrical circuits, the best and not the worst at the same time. This way, this is a field of hybrid system. And what I would like you to understand that it possibly could be possible to go even beyond the hybrids by having, say, say nuclear spins with extremely long current time coupled to electron spins. These electron spins could be coupled to superconducting circuits that could be read out using the, the method that we already know. So maybe in the future, there will be an architecture exploiting nuclear spins with extremely long current times and coupled to electrical circuits, and of course, um, to optical photons for communication. So we have worked on this hybrid uh, strategy. Uh, we are not yet on uh, developing an architecture uh, exploiting nuclear spin. This is a bit, a bit far away. But if you want to dream, a dream could be that in the long term, there could be an architecture in which the, the qubits would be nuclear spins with extremely long current times, and they would be coupled and, uh, and read out using superconducting quantum bit circuit. Now you have heard about the D-Wave. You may have even read uh, this paper in the New York Times, this uh, article in New York Times, and seen picture like that. So this is a, a picture of their chip. Uh, their strategy here is very different. It's so-called adiabatic quantum computing. So if I put a question mark here, it's not clear that this machine does perform adiabatic quantum computing, but it's interesting to, to look at what it does. In my mind, I, I, I think it's a more an handling machine assisted by quantum physics. So what it means? So this is what I have explained to you is the quantum computing wave. This is a standard route. This standard route is performing the unitary evolution of the qubit register. So the difficulty is really that uh, you need to, to perform the readout, error correction, and scalability is not easy. The state of the art is just a few, say, uh, processors with a few qubits with about 10 in view, but 10 in view is, will be without error correction. And there was a proof of principle for quantum speed up on very elementary problems, and I have shown one to you. And there are not many, huh? just uh, two, two or three. Now, the adiabatic quantum computing way is, uh, is very different. So you follow the ground state of a Hamiltonian here. So you take uh, spins, uh, Ising spins, for uh, so the Hamiltonian, the, each spin, they are coupled for Z, so plus uh, G, G sigma Z, sigma prime Z, plus minus. And you've, you start by putting all your, all your spin in a very large field, and then you reduce the field, and you increase the coupling. And you put, say, a transverse coupling this way. And you follow the ground state. So the quantum physics tell you that if you follow adiabatically, if the evolution is adiabatic, you will end up in the ground state of this Hamiltonian. And if this Hamiltonian is non-trivial, uh, you can say, uh, say the ground state of this Hamiltonian can encode the solution of a non-trivial problem. This is the so-called adiabatic quantum computing strategy. So the evolution is simple. Now, the encoding a problem into this Hamiltonian is not that easy, but it's clearly this is a good strategy for optimization of, uh, of an energy function. And 
uh, we have to say that the role of decurrence and temperature is not understood. Because if, uh, if you do not follow the ground state, you lose. You lose the game. So what D-Wave has already done is to fabricate a qubit with about 500 spins here. So the machine works, uh, not perfectly, but it works. And they could uh, solve the, they could find the, say, the ground state of an Ising spin glass problem with about 100 spins. So this problem is much more difficult than the one that we have solved in the academic world using our academic processes. But the difficulty that uh, it, uh, it has been is that it has not been proven that this machine um, provides a quantum speed up. In fact, uh, quantum speed up was not demonstrated, and there is this very recent paper in Science that concludes that uh, this machine um, is not superior to a classical algorithm. So it's not superior to classical algorithm possibly, but it's definitely superior to our academic processes. So speed up on one side on very elementary problem. Here, no speed up, but machine able to solve a, a more difficult problem. So this is uh, what I wanted to tell to you today. And I would like to leave some time for, 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 for a few questions. So this is a picture of our, uh, you see, smiley, smiling Quantronics group at CI Saclay. Well, it's not the, the group is slightly smaller. Than we have uh, some local friends on this picture. And all the people involved in the quantum information processing work are listed here. So we have uh, two PhD students. Uh, we had previous, uh, say, the two qubit processors where processor was developed by uh, DOS. And uh, the readout was developed by Agustin Palacios and other previous students and postdocs. And of course, we had different collaborations uh, uh, in France and, and abroad. So uh, to make it short, uh, the routes explored towards uh, quantum computing using superconducting circuits are, are numerous. And but there are many roadblocks on the way but research uh, goes on. And if you look back at the progress since the demonstration uh, 15 years ago of quantum currents in electrical circuits, the progress has been extremely important. So if you extrapolate uh, the past to the future, maybe uh, there will be a significant process, progress, uh, say, within uh, not so many years. That, um, I cannot tell you, but you can make your mind yourself. Thanks. So I've heard that some people actually use the D-Wave quantum computer to calculate solutions to certain problems. Why is that if it doesn't provide an exponential speed up? Is it just that that machine is optimized for a particular problem that a standard classical computer is not optimized for and therefore it is faster, or is there something else? So, uh, so the D-Wave machine is clearly optimized for finding the ground state of an Ising spin glass because it's built uh, a not of any spin glass because, uh, say, the, the connecting network is not uh, totally universal. But it's, uh, it can optimize. So it's really uh, organized for that. But there are also classical algorithms uh, that have been developed for solving this problem because, uh, say, the physics community has I search quite intensively on solving this problem. So that uh, presently there are excellent classical algorithms for finding the one state of an Ising spin glass. Now, if you take a larger problem, the classical algorithm may, may fail. They will not scale with, uh, say, the speed will, uh, will slow down with the size of the problem, whereas the speed of the quantum uh, algorithm is supposed uh, to, say, uh, Say the, the bigger the problem, the, the better the performance of the quantum machine compared to the classical algorithm. But up to now, uh, it, was not sh it was not found that there is a, a gain. Say a good, a good classical algorithm is able to do better than the D-Wave machine. But it's, uh, it's very interesting to know uh, 
how much quantum power there is in the D wave machine. This is uh, a bit controversial because uh, uh, some people say that, uh, say, Jordi Rowe, the CEO of D wave, makes the claim that this machine has the full power of quantum computing and that all the academics have been dumped to, to try to perform the unitary evolution of a quantum register. On the same side, we have physicists who say that the D current in this machine, uh, in the D wave machine, the current is so poor that it cannot follow the ground state uh, for, uh, in the case of a difficult problem. Yes, the difficulty for the adiabatic evolution is that during the evolution at some point, say the gap between the ground state and the excited state, this gap can go to zero. This is a hard point. This is a difficult point to, to pass. And uh, in, in presence of decurrence and thermal excitation, you might simply get lost when passing at the point where the gap is zero. So there are some things that it's impossible to stay in the ground state when there is really a zero gap. So we'll, we'll see what happens. It's a, but it's a very interesting question to investigate. Definitively, it shows that the adiabatic quantum evolution is less demanding in terms of quantum currents, but nevertheless, it requires, it requires quantum coherence. And what is sure is that the currents of the D-wave machine is very poor.